Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to the Flower Lounge. I am so excited to be here with our next guest, Brigitte Mars. She is an herbalist and a nutritional consultant of natural health with almost 50 years of experience. She teaches herbal medicine at Naropa University and the School of Health Mastery in Iceland. She has taught at Omega, Esalen, Kripalu, Sivananda Yoga Ashram, Arise, Envision, and Unify Festivals, and the Mayo Clinic. She blogs for the Huffington Post in Care 2, and she's a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild. She is author of many amazing books and DVDs, many of which I have, including The Natural First Aid Handbook, The Home Reference to Holistic Health and Healing, The Country Almanac of Home Remedies, The Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine, Beauty by Nature, Addiction Free Naturally, The Sexual Herbal, Healing Herbal Teas, Rossum, and co-author of The Hemp Nut Cookbook. Her DVDs include Sacred Psychoactive, Herbal Wizardry for Kids of All Ages, Natural Remedies for Childhood Ailments, Overcoming Addictions, and Natural Remedies for Emotional Health. You can see she is a fountain of wisdom. And her latest project is a really cool phone app called iPlant. Brigitte and her daughter Sunflower Sparkle Mars run Herb Camp for Kids in Boulder, Colorado. And her other daughter is world famous activist, yogini, actress, international model, Rainbow Mars. So if you want to check out her work, it's at BrigitteMars.com, and that's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E Mars.com. I'm so excited to have you, Brigitte. Thank you. Blessings to you, Katie. <laughs> I was hoping we could do a little exercise in the beginning that I do with each of the guests. It's really relaxing and fun, and that would be just to take a couple minutes to close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers and plants and trees. And just to think about what you were doing then and who you were with and if a favorite flower or plant or tree arises in your mind. And then thinking to yourself in your mind, if that flower, plant or tree had three words, if you could describe its personality in three words, how would you describe it? And then when you're ready, open your eyes and tell me what you thought of. Well, I thought of dandelion because they're everywhere. And I thought bright yellow energy. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> That's what we find is the way you would describe your childhood flower is how you most uniquely bring your gifts to the world. Mm, lovely. Nice. <laughs> And dandelion, so many people consider it a weed. It's my favorite. Um, it's kind of amazing. Like, it's a good I, segue. Uh, tell <clears throat> me, tell me, tell our listeners about the dandelion. I'm a huge fan of it, and I, I feel like people should let it be in their yards and blow the seeds all around. It has so much magic. Tell us more. Well, I see dandelion as being a warrior plant because it survives, and plants that survive adversity such as, you know, nobody waters the dandelion or fertilizes it or tries to cultivate it. And yet it grows so rampantly. It can grow through the cracks and sidewalks. And no matter that there've been so many attempts to destroy this plant, it just finds a way to survive. And I think right now when we're looking at our polluted planet and chemtrails and fracking, ugh, so many things, I think that the dandelion has minerals in it. Um, it actually aerates the soil and makes nutrients available for other plants. Every part of the plant is useful. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, you can dig up the root, you can take the milk from the stem, the milky sap, and put it on a wart. Really, they have like hundreds of uses. I have an ebook out called Dandelion Medicine that mm -hmm. you can you know, get online. And we use dandelions to make all kinds of food, juice it, make tea. So we need to be more Jedi. And if we're looking for ways that we can adapt on this planet, celebrate the dandelion. Please don't spray it. And if you live in one of those homeowners associations, start going to the meetings and get petitions going and let people know that dandelions are one of the first foods for the bees in the springtime. So mm. we want this plant to flourish. It's 
you know, brightens our lives in many ways. Why do you think there's such a war on dandelions? I, I talked to so many people and so many people say that that's their favorite flower from childhood. They remember, you know, blowing the seeds into the wind and it's such a sort of magical plant. And yet there's such a war on it and other types of weeds. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it competes with food. You know, people think that it's somehow like peasants to go and collect wild food, that you need to get all your food at the store and it needs to have a label and a barcode and uh, directions and uh, recipes and all that. So I think we've been bamboozled in a big way about many things. And so I think the message of dandelions is use me. I'm everywhere. I'm free. I'm available. And there's also this myth that dandelions kill the grass. Mm. I think a lot of people think, oh, dandelions will kill the grass. And the truth is the dandelions don't kill the grass. They actually survive the adversity when there's drought or, you know, frost or poor soil, soil nutrients, the dandelions actually aerate the soil and make nutrients more available for the other plants. Mm, wow. That's so fascinating. We've been bamboozled big time. Time to take back the dandelion. <laughs> it's so amazing. And of course, it's close. It's relative is sunflower. See a picture of that behind me. <laughs> and what are some of the other weeds that uh, we should sort of tune into and become more aware of their either their healing benefits or their food benefits. What are what are other gems and treasures that we have in our backyards that we're not even aware of? Well, Emerson said a weed is an herb whose virtue has not yet been recognized, and I love that quote. But other things that people think are weeds, like purslane, people will work and sweat in their garden pulling a purslane and portulaca oleocera. It was Gandhi's favorite food. We know that purslane is really high in omega-3 fatty acids, makes a great salsa, gazpacho, violet leaves. So I have an article that was on Huffington Post. It's online. You can read it. It's called Get Off Your Grass and Create an Edible Lawn because <laughs> Americans right now are using a third of their nation's water supply to water grass. Mm. And it's not a crop that most people are eating, unless you're a cow or a goat, perhaps. But to spend that much water on something that we don't eat, that's so old school. We need to conserve water. We need to use our water wisely. Many parts of the country have deal with drought. And again, the weeds survive. But if we would learn the names of the weeds, we would see that mm. these are plants that have served humanity, you know, served millions of people for thousands of years. So in my article, Get Off Your Grass and Create an Edible Lawn, I have suggestions of other nice, low-growing plants that you might grow that could provide pollen and nectar for the bees and the butterflies and hummingbirds, you know, things like clover and red clover, purslane, violets. So just see what comes up naturally, too. So we, we need to rethink the American lawn in a big way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to share a personal experience, I have this elderly dog named Joy, who's fantastic. And she, for the last over a year now, she would have these moments of like being on the brink of death and then coming back and being on the brink of death and coming back. And she has this kind of bizarre condition where her blood isn't producing enough red blood cells. And so if she, you know, falls or gets hurt, she's prone to internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. And so I learned about things like shepherd's prayers and cayenne for, for their amazing, magical, rapid speed abilities to stop internal hemorrhaging and bleeding. And then I realized that there is shepherd's purse growing everywhere here in Phoenix. And, you know, I just started like teaching people about it and the little ones and mentioning it. And it's like, how incredible is that, that something that is life saving is just like right there in the backyard if people knew about it. And with other dogs in this condition, everybody else I've talked to, you know, they do the whole like rush them to the vet, put them on an IV, and they just end up dying like pretty immediately after that. And so the fact that she got like a whole extra more than a year because mm -hmm. of this like simple weed that grows in the backyard is just like astonishing to me. But that brings up a point too, that we give a lot of our power away. We are always looking for someone else to heal us. And yesterday I had a, a client and they said, you know, you healed one of my 
best friend. She had an incurable disease. And I just said, you know, I don't really heal anybody. I teach people how to heal themselves. Mm-hmm. Myself, mm-hmm. the grace of God, the great plants that are available, dietary changes. And it's up to people to take responsibility for that. But I think we really been conditioned to think that we couldn't possibly know what our bodies need. And yet, you know, I, I often ask people, what do you feel would help you? So food for thought. Right. Have you had any of those experiences where sort of rubber hits the road and you get an illness and you have to sort of, you know, jump off the cliff a little bit in terms of trusting that the herbs are really going to do it for you? I mean, I, I, you've, you've been at this a long time, so I imagine you've, you know, done, worked with your own body and using herbs. Have you had any experiences where you've sort of like had to push through that last little layer of doubt? You know, having children, you know, I love my children very, very much. Yeah. And I've, I've never learned to drive a car still at this age. I probably am not going to learn. But there were many, many times with my children where I always said, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to give them herbs. Maybe I'm going to do compresses. Maybe I'm going to, you know, make special soup. I'm going to do everything I can. Essential oils, put an aromatherapy diffuser in the room. So there were many, many times with my children that I used natural medicine and really Mm -hmm. went out on a limb. And I also felt that if it didn't work, I would certainly get medical attention. I'm not one of these parents who's going to allow their children to perish if they can't be helped, but it always worked. And I have a house guest right now who actually treated my daughter she spent a year living with her godparents on the island of Molokai. And at one time she had threat three brown recluse spider bites, which can be very, very dangerous. And even that, we, you know, we were able to, you know, I sent over some homeopathic remedies and some herbs and they were even able to overcome that. But of course, you know, in cases of accidents, I'm not trying to say that allopathic medicine can't be useful. I mean, they have made amazing strides in emergency and first aid care, but I feel like the best is yet to come when we put our heads and hearts together and take more responsibility for our health and use allopathic medicine when necessary. But there's so much that we can do to help the body to heal. Right. And it's really quite joyous because who's going to love you more than yourself, really? Aww. So what would, what would you put in a, in a home first aid kit? Well, I would certainly have a bottle of lavender oil and tea tree oil. Mm-hmm. That would be great. For burns. Because or... they're so antimicrobial and you can use them topically. Um, they can be applied directly to the skin and they can repel bugs. They can be put on a bug bite. Lavender oil is good on burns. You can smell lavender oil like smelling salts. It's a wonderful antidepressant. I also think of uh, a good echinacea tincture. I mean, th- that's it. Some rescue remedy, two drops of rescue remedy is good for any kind of emotional crises. I would have a little tube of homeopathic arnica for bumps and bruises, things that you probably have in your first aid kit, Katie. But it's really important to know what to do mm-hmm. ahead of time because I think very often when there's a life-threatening situation, people freak out because they don't know what to do. So I think it's important to study first aid before it becomes an issue. And my latest book, the Natural First Aid Handbook, not only has what to do for bug bites and bruises and bleeding, I, and I do love Shepherd's Purse and Cayenne and all the things you mentioned, but it also has ideas on like what to do for hurricane, tornado, avalanche, Mm. flooding, how to find water when the water's been turned off. And all you have to do is look at the news and know that there's perilous stuff happening every day. And people are like, well, until Red Cross comes, we don't know what to do. And Mm. so we need to, because right now there's just so many crises on the planet. We haven't even taken care of the last ones and a few more arise. Right, right. Yeah, I just in terms of when you mentioned echinacea, I was thinking so many people are familiar with echinacea for, you know, taking right at the onset of a cold to try to boost the immune system. And in here in Phoenix, we have rattlesnakes in the desert. And I've always heard that if you get bit by a rattlesnake, you can take a, a, a full tincture of echinacea and just take it like a shot and 
being in Costa Rica, there are so many poisonous snakes. And I, I wondered if you knew or if you had heard any good stories about echinacea in terms of um, getting that types of poison out of the body. Well, I don't know if you read this part of my book, but years ago, you know, I lived in a teepee for two and a half years in the Ozarks and ate nothing but wild edible plants. But we had electricity in the teepee because we had these beautiful Afghani rugs. And so we had a little shop vac to vacuum the rugs. And one night I got bit by a copperhead snake. And my partner at the time turned on the shop vac and sucked out the venom. <laughs> And, you know, my a former partner was also living on the farm and saying, we should take her to the hospital. We should take her to the hospital, which was a couple hours away. And I was looking at my books. What do I do? What do I do? Snake bite. Ah. And, you know, this one book had all these wonderful Chinese herbs in it that mm. were not available in the state in this. <laughs> and then I came across in another book that the Native Americans used echinacea. She was growing right where the snake was. So this to me, another example of, you know, there was a snake right by the echinacea and that, you know, just like things like poison ivy, very often the remedy for poison ivy is growing very close to the poison ivy. But I actually chewed on the echinacea root. We made a poultice of it. We didn't have tinctures at the time because this was maybe 40 years ago, yeah. but we just chopped up the root and then we made tea and the natives called echinacea Missouri snake root in Missouri and Kansas snake root in Kansas. So it is good for any kind of venomous bite, scorpion, tarantula. And of course, if most people will want to start out there treating something that could be very life-threatening. But, you know, what did our ancestors do? What did the people who lived on this continent for thousands of years, what did they do? And yes, it was herbs. Mm, wow, what a great story. I love that. And so what are some of the herbs that you carry with you all the time? Do you carry anything other than what you mentioned for the first aid kit? Well, I'm always looking around for what there is. So because I don't drive a car, I walk everywhere. And I'm always kind of scoping out what is there. So, for example, when my kids were little, um, Rainbow got stung by a bee. And I could have put lavender oil on it. That would be good. But I don't think I had anything with me at the time. Mm -hmm. But there was an herb called Grindelia. So... I collected some Grindelia, also known as gumweed, Grindelia robusta, and um, I chewed some up and I put it on there. And right away she stopped crying and it was anti-inflammatory. I could have used plantain, but I'm always scoping around for what there is. And another thing I love to do is I just walk through this earth is nibble on things that are so fresh, they're still growing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think there's a vitamin that can be the energy or chi that you get from like chewing on some young spruce tips or eating a fresh dandelion flower or eating a rose hip that is still on the shrub. Mm. But other things that I carry with me, maybe a little salve. I might have a, a salve, a comfrey calendula salve. So those for, are some of the basics. Mm -hmm. And the salve would be for like healing skin irritations and rashes. Right, you, get a little, and... you get a little scratch or something. And if you need to make the salve even more antimicrobial, you could add a little tea tree or lavender oil to it. Mm -hmm. So what about the common remedies that most people have in their kitchen that they may not even be aware of that are healing remedies? Well, um, I, I wrote a book maybe three books ago called The Country Almanac of Home Remedies. And mm -hmm. it's very much about kitchen medicine. My mm -hmm. grandmother, my grandmère, she's French-Canadian, and her remedies were things like cabbage and potatoes and lemon and apple cider vinegar. And I really think there's like a hundred things you can do with apple cider vinegar. It's good for a cold. It's good for the flu. It's good for a headache. It's good for stomach upset. It's good for a hangover. It's good for food poisoning, on and on and on. Mm. Cabbage is also an amazing remedy. And not only should we be eating more cabbage, it has wonderful anti-cancer properties but it's also very anti-inflammatory. And she would take a cabbage leaf and roll it with a rolling pin to break down the cell walls and then mm -hmm. use it topically, whether it be on back pain or sore knees. And I also remember doing this when my daughter Sunflower was nursing and had um, mastitis or breast infection. We 
rolled a cabbage leaf, cut a hole in it, put it over her breast, and she was able to nurse through the hole in the cabbage leaf. Oh my God. And the cabbage leaf would draw out the infection and help to cool the inflammation and that is so amazing. You know, when I first came back to the States, I worked at a health food store and this woman used to come in who had breast cancer and she did the same thing. She had the, you know, rolled the, the cabbage leaves and she had them stuck in her bra all the time, which I thought, God, that's like so interesting. <laughs> yeah. So th- that's a great one. And la- lemon, you know, if you have a lemon is really antimicrobial. So I love the idea of what do you have in your kitchen? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, baking soda and apple cider vinegar is a great application for bug bites or chicken pox, um, itchy sores, for example. Baking soda is something, you know, we use it as a natural deodorizer, but it's also can be used to make an electrolyte, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, quarter teaspoon of a good salt like Celtic salt in water, you know, certainly could take the place of a lot of those electrolyte drinks without the sugar. Mm. So if someone um, had heat stroke or they came in from a long day at the out in the sun, they could make themselves a drink with salt. And- yes, absolutely. And, you know, a bath with some baking soda is very detoxifying. So I love the idea of kitchen medicine. Mm. And, that, you know, very often we think, you know, when we're in a crisis, the last thing you want to be doing is driving across town to go to the health food store and waiting in line when you have a child that just, you know, got a burn or just got, mm. you know, fell off their skateboard or something you want to be able to act fast right and that's why you know the old adage you know be prepared yeah it's really our responsibility if we're going to be caregivers and take care of our children to know what to do it's very empowering because then you can give the best care and what you do in the immediate reaction can make Mm -hmm. a big difference between not only life or death but short-term care or long-term care Right, right. And it puts it in your own hands. I just spoke to a friend of mine last night about the apple cider vinegar, and he's wanting to transition into to applying to be in the police force. And so he's trying to lose weight. And he's been drinking apple cider vinegar every day to help him lose weight. And he said, the first time he drank it, he just threw up. He thought it tasted so bad. (laughs) I actually kind of quite like it. But I wondered if you had any, you know, personal recipes, like, shrub like you know these shrub drinks where you know you're adding apple cider vinegar to other things do you have any secret ways to make it more palatable for people who find it a little off-putting um sure and i wonder if you didn't dilute it because uh, my favorite remedy is like <laughs> two teaspoons of unpasteurized apple cider vinegar mm-hmm. two teaspoons of really raw honey in a cup of warm water mm-hmm. and use less honey if you want to and some of my vegan friends might want to use you know, maple syrup instead of that. But um, yeah, dilute it in water. But the reason that apple cider vinegar works so well, one, if you get a unpasteurized apple cider vinegar, it has probiotics in it. Mm. It's also very alkalinizing. And I know that's a bit curious because we often think of it as being acid, right. but it mm. actually stimulates an alkaline reaction in the body. It's also really high in vitamin C which is antimicrobial, and it's diuretic. So those are at least four ways that we know that it works. So I like to just put it in honey. And, you know, very often people come over and rather than offering them herb tea, I give them a little toddy of apple cider vinegar and honey and (laughs) and like it. So I hope your friend aspiring to be a police will try it again. And, you know, and it should be unpasteurized apple cider vinegar, not so much the white wine or the balsamic vinegar. They're not as medicinal really. Mm -hmm. And is it necessary or beneficial that the mother is still in the vinegar? Well, the kinds that I buy do have the mother in there. So there's a few brands out there like Bragg's and Sterling, Mm -hmm. Eden Foods. Those are a few available Mm -hmm. at natural food stores. Mm -hmm. Great. And what are you most excited about right now? What are you teaching... Um, I mean, you have just like a a million pieces of wisdom in all the books you've written and the DVDs you've made. What's the most kind of on the edge thing that you're into right now? Well, on the edge, Hmm. I'm, (laughs) I've been talking a lot about cannabis actually. And I know that seems on the edge, but I really don't know another plant that can do so many things to help the environmental problems on our planet. And I'm not talking about you know, smoking cannabis all day long. But when I think about this is a plant that 
could, grows as tall as a tree in one season that could be used to make paper and fabric, fuel, that the seeds are an excellent food source. And, you know, the Bible says, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. There's no mention about like, mm, but not that one. Um, so I guess that's a little bit edgy. And I'm speaking on December 1st at the International Church of Cannabis, which is actually a church here in Denver. Wow. And I'm going to <laughs> talk on it. I'm also very active right now in helping to prevent fracking in our community mm. because they want to put 2,000 fracking wells in beautiful Boulder County. And I'm also writing a racy's um, 60s memoir about, you know, living in the teepee and all my adventures. Oh my so gosh. I'm working on that. And I have a, I, I have so many projects and life is really full and every day is a new adventure. But I, you know, I turned 65 last week. So I actually made a list of like big projects I want to complete. So I'd like to do an online course and I mean, this year I get to teach in Iceland and it looks like Colombia and the Bahamas. So, you know, the I, the concept that I can take this show on the road and wherever I go, I'm going to learn the plants there. And right. I think there's great virtue in, you know, if you're in the Bahamas, you want to use plants that grow there. If you're in Costa Rica, there's so many wonderful mm. plants there. So I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay, so let's just go back to the cannabis topic. I'm just going to um, ask you some questions about all that information you just shared. What would you say to someone like me who has had past experiences in terms of the whole family members using it and seeing lives be destroyed by it or health, phys you know, people like negatively affected by it? How would you help a person like me see the virtues of it? that are beyond, you know, or anyone else that are sort of beyond the whole smoking it kind of thing? You know, I really try not to encourage people to use herbs allopathically. We don't want to just use an herb to cover something up. So, you know, all these people are saying, oh, cannabis helps with pain. Okay, that's great. And I realize that it does. And so do other herbs like Corydalis or turmeric and all that. But we want to look at, well, what are you doing in your life that's contributing to the pain? You know, is it because you're running on concrete? Is it because you're using your back in a way and, you know, holding your child on one side, which is something moms do a lot. So, you know, for all these people are saying it's really helped pain or helped their health. I would say, well, have you tried quitting smoking cigarettes or have you tried going gluten-free or have you tried yoga or meditation? So we want to get to the source. Have you tried rolfing or body work that might help to realign the structure of your body? So I don't want to recommend any herb allopathically. Mm. And, you know, I do think we need a, a different type of drug education because we've gone from just say no. And that doesn't mean just say yes all the time. Right. And so I think that, you know, this is a very powerful plant. We do have receptor sites for it in our bodies. And I think that the important thing is to get to the source of the pain. If someone's depressed and they're wanting to use an herb, whether it be, you know, cannabis or St. John's wort or lavender or lemon balm, you know, we should start looking at depression as a liver centered condition that why are you so depressed? Maybe it's because you're eating fried foods or you're eating a bag of chips, or you drink too much coffee. So I'm sort of like a detective. I always want to get to the roots of what's causing the problem. And then of course, the whole idea of smoking, you know, there's ways of minimizing harm by using a water pipe. And then, you know, right now I know a lot of elderly people who are using strains of cannabis that are low THC, so it really doesn't affect their consciousness. But the CBD, the cannabidiol that's in there, is actually really good for relieving pain and inflammation. So, you know, one of my friends, like 85 year old father, has MS. The last thing he needs is something that's going to make him disorientated. And he was very, very resistant, but yet here's a nerve that's really helping him. And he uses it, you know, minus the THC. And I think probably one of the best uses of this plant is juicing the fresh plant, juicing the leaves, which is not psychoactive, but it's really high in chlorophyll and minerals. So I, those are just a few things that I think of in, you know, how we need to educate. And, you know, what do we tell our young people? 
you know, I think that there's a lot of things we should be telling them. And it's not just say yes all the time, but, you know, whatever someone would do, it should be done with um, intention and in a safe setting with people you know and trust. And when your work is done, but I think right now there's a, a lot of overuse and it's kind of a big joke. And a lot of the edibles have sugar and hydrogenated oil in them and all that. So yeah, just like we educate about any herb. I wouldn't take golden seal every day. I wouldn't take echinacea every day. I love that. I love what you're saying. It's like seeing it as a highly revered medicinal substance versus in my experience, I've only seen it as you know the thing that covers up what's really going on emotionally. And so if we can get past that whole, oh, well, I take it to sleep or I wake up at three in the morning and I'm overthinking about all these things that are painful for me. So I take it to just numb that out. If we can get around that and really, like you said, get to the root of why, you know, what's, what's driving us to, to use it. And also what other substances, I mean, there are like what, almost 400,000 species of plants out there that we could be tapping into. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. So I'm curious what you're, you're, you know, segueing into like hallucinogens and, and what you're, what your opinions are there. I just recently spoke with a gentleman, a young guy in Costa Rica who used to work with mushrooms a lot. And then he came to this, he was telling me this experience about how he came to this realization that, that it felt like a shortcut to him and that he would, you know, attain a certain level of consciousness or awareness around a certain topic or himself or his life or his patterning. And then, you know, three, three to four days after it would just sort of fly out of his mind and he'd be back to the usual patterning. And he realized that actually his heart had so much to teach him and mm-hmm. that he, he didn't feel like he, you know, needed the shortcut that because he, he was like tapping into something else in his own body and psyche to attain that cert- same level of awareness. And I wondered how you felt about that and what your experience is around that hallucinogen plants well i think that there's a lot of ways to achieve altered states of consciousness you know including yoga and meditation and holotropic breath work and chanting and creating art and i think those are all really good things and just like i you know speak about cannabis i think you know if we were to do um drug education there's an acronym i like to use and it's called epic And it means if there was something you were thinking of taking, you should educate yourself about it. You should find out what does it do to your body? How long does it last? What is a safe dosage? So that's the E. And then the P would be preparation. So preparing safe set and setting, maybe thinking about having some tools for exploration, things that you want to play with. Maybe it's flower essences or essential oils or color therapy you know, what kind of music are you going to listen to? The I is intention. Why are you doing this? And then the C in Epic is coalesce. Like, how are you going to integrate this into your life? So I see these substances having the potential to awaken consciousness, but it's really what you do with it, you know, and if it's not helping you access something, then, you know, really what is the point? And I think that they can be really powerful. And for some people, it shows them something like, sometimes I like to joke, Katie, and say, you know, the hippies were right all along because 50 years ago, we were doing solar energy and recycling and organic gardening and natural childbirth and yoga and meditation and using psychoactives as a a medicine, usually in ceremony, you know, a lot of those things. And now we're finding out like, oh, those are all really positive things. Like, yeah, we should be doing solar energy and we should be recycling. We should be doing organic gardening. But I also think that because there hasn't been any type of education, like it's just been like a big party. And I see a lot of people, I'm doing these substances and going to a concert where maybe the music is very negative. There's a lot of bad things penetrating our consciousness all the time. Lyrics that are full of profanity and ego and it's really polluting when you're in that sensitive state to allow all that in. I think that can be very detrimental. Yeah, so. I think it, it's become, and from my perspective, it's become very trendy, you know, like go to South America and ayahuasca. And it almost seems like back to the allopathic to me. Like, you know, in terms of using plant medicine for spirituality, it's like, 
okay, so I have all these patterns and something's kind of wrong with me and I'm going to use this plant to fix me. It just seems, you know, like, again, we could benefit tremendously from coming back to this holistic perspective and like what you're saying, making it really sacred and meaningful and ceremonial versus something that's trendy or shortcut or fix it driven. And it may be that the plant isn't really intended to fix you, but to give you ideas or guidance about what you need to do to fix yourself. Right. <clears throat> However, um, my friend, Dr. Andrew Weil, likes to say substances that have the potential to make you vomit have a much lower potential for abuse. And so sometimes doing those sacred ceremonies where you do throw up and you find out like, oh, wow, that was like resentment or bitterness or envy or something that I've held on to for years and that getting rid of that can open a path to our healing. Mm -hmm. But you might also get an insight like, boy, I need to you know eat more green leafy vegetables or I need to drink more better quality water. But then it's up to you to do it. Right. So it, it might open the doors of perception for some. But again, I see a lot of, you know, people using them in a way that's just following the crowd and imprinting upon things that might really be detrimental and damaging to the psyche. I, you know, I have to say, I, I went to Burning Man for the first time last year and my partner and I wept. It's like, this is, this is what we're doing with all our money. We're going to build all this stuff and burn it and... Mm, yeah, I know there's a lot of beauty there and there was a lot of beautiful people there, but I also heard a lot of profanity and a lot of drinking. And anyways, I, I'm, I'm sure wasn't most your, people have a great time there, but it wasn't your cup of tea. So sad. Wasn't your cup of tea. I'm, I'm into sustainability and evolution and spirituality and health and healing. So, so wherever I, we make that happen, that's great. I've never been, what was it that, that triggered you or tipped you off? Was it a, excess was it I, I think that what bothered me is a lot of the music um there's a lot of cussing in it a lot of the f word a lot of the n word and it's like really this this is what we're doing in these modern advanced times like it's okay to do that and people are in this sensitive state and they are having this penetrate their consciousness mm -hmm. and that made me kind of sad um i know there was a lot of beauty and art i love the art the burning of things in the, you know, burning the man and burning the temple reminded me a little bit of the witch burnings. Like mm. there's something burning and everybody's, yay, yay, burn the man, burn the man. And it, it made me um, feel like this is sort of a, a scapegoat and it created a lot of smoke, made it really difficult to breathe. But <laughs> I don't always say like, I didn't really like Burning Man because I know I have friends who've been 20 times. Yeah, it sounds kind of impractical. So I love that you are writing a memoir. I am fascinated by the whole art of memoir these days in a culture where pretty much anything we can Google, knowledge is not exciting so much anymore, rather personal experience. And, you know, such as learning about your own personal experiences with herbs. It's like no one could duplicate that in any herb book. That's your experience. And I, it's your story. And these are things that we can't read anywhere else. It's, it's, it's yours. It's your story. And so I was wondering if in your writing of your memoir, if there's any part or piece that you'd like to give us a little teaser of some story that brings you joy or has an interesting an anecdote. Boy, there's, there's so many in there. And I, you know, it, it also has a lot about the history of the natural foods industry, you know, all the people I got to meet. But there's certainly a lot in there, I'd say, about living in the teepee and mm -hmm. about how people think like, oh, what a nice laid back thing that might be, but yet how much work it really was to, you know, fetch water and chop wood and um, have two small children, mm. you know, washing my clothes in a creek with a little squirt of Dr. Bronner's soap. Sometimes <laughs> I'd have to make a hole in the ice and then I'd hang all my diapers up on a clothesline and they would freeze Ooh. and then I would bring them in the teepee and fold them. I mean, so there's a lot of stories about the realities of, you know, living in a very primitive way and also, <clears throat> you know, finding wild edible plants and how much work that was to, you know, provide food for, uh, you know, a group of people that was anything from like six to, you know, 25 people, you know, harvesting acorns and berries and all that. And what, what motivated you to do that in the first place? 
Well, you know, there was that Crosby, Stills, and Nash song about we got to get back to the land. Um, <laughs> and so at the time, you know, the war in Vietnam was going on. And so a lot of young people thought, no, we're going to get back to the land and we're going to grow our own food and we're going to, you know, teach our kids you know, important things, not just what was being taught in school. Certainly they would, you know, maybe they would even go to public school. My kids did go to public school, but they were also going to learn about gardening and plant identification. And, you know, both of my kids, by the time they had, you know, were five years old, had been to a number of births and seen babies born and learned a little bit about midwifery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all those stories are in there, you know, meeting Dr. Bronner and lots of, uh, lots of stories and and just as you were speaking about living in a tp and how hard it, how hard it actually was what kind of wisdom can you bring to the table for having had that experience in terms of going back to the land and also using the tools that were given so whether it's you know a cell phone or modern technologies living in a home with heat where you don't have, you know, a washer and dryer, like, what did you glean from that experience? When, when can we go back to nature? And when is it just make more sense to use what we have? Well, right now, I I think because of my experience of living that way, I see how much water we waste. Like we really waste a lot of water. I mean, people were clean and leave the sink running and running. And so a thing that I've started doing because I used to have to walk to go fetch water with a couple of buckets. And very often it was easier to like carry the dishes in the buckets to the creek and wash them in the creek. But nowadays I actually have a little basin in my sink and it catches water that I might use to like rinse an apple or rinse a plate before I put it in the dishwasher or, you know, rinse the sponge, like all that water. I collect the basin like several times a day and open the door and give it to the mint plants or the hollyhocks or a raspberry bush. And so there's a little proverb I like a lot. It says, if you have water to throw away, throw it on a plant and how much richer we could all be if like right outside our door there was parsley and sage growing because we're just constantly watering it and you know you live in phoenix and you know there's a lot of people in the world that the the water is where does it come from we don't really know where our water comes from and there's all these chemicals added to the water but i'd say that for me a big thing has been like respect for the planet's resources and i don't know how long we can go on you know being so wasteful and so you know could we dry our clothes in the air rather than using more electricity you know compost even though we live downtown i I live right downtown boulder and i do compost and save water and i do you know at least put a lot of my laundry out on a thing on the porch to dry Mm -hmm. so Uh, It really made me committed to living a more ecological life. And I think that people think that when they live in the city that you can't do that. But really, we all need to. We have to really step up our game because there's not a lot of time. And as our population of the planet increases, you know, there's more people putting more demands. And we know that our country is using like 80% of the world's resources and using water to water grass. uh Uh-uh. You know, even, you know, another thing, this might be a bit edgy, but you said we're out on the edge here, but one of the people that lives in my house, she, you know, uses flannel as a menstrual cloth Mm -hmm. and then she soaks the bloody flannel cloths. And at the end of the day, she goes and gives the blood water to an apple tree outside, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than thinking like, oh, I have to go buy stuff with plastic applicators. And, you know, the average woman uses 10 to 20,000 feminine hygiene products in her lifetime. And then women wonder why they have cramps because the media is saying, you know, if you're on your moon time, plug yourself up and wear tight white jeans and go horseback riding. And I'm really <laughs> to like start honoring that blood. Like, well, I could give that back as um, nourishment to the earth. It is, after all, you know, nourishment that could be used to grow new life. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd say it's really everything. And just, we just need to step up our game really fast. And Mm -hmm. right now, I don't think there's a a few days that don't go by without some kind of cataclysm on the planet. And this area needs aid and these people are without heat. And so we're going to have to learn to share more Mm -hmm. because 
I have someone staying with me right now who is from Puerto Rico and doesn't have power yet. And that's one reason why he's here. So wow. uh, we've got to figure it out. We need to be rebuilding with things that are more sustainable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Solar and wind. I was just in Carbondale, Colorado, and it's right near Aspen. And yet most of the town is solar. <clears throat> if they can do it up in the mountains where it's snowy and cold, hey, the rest of the country can follow suit. Right. Right. Yeah. So much to do. And, you know, there's the external world and all the things that we can do. And then there's the internal world and all the things we do there. And this year, I find it so interesting why this year, maybe it's just the point of life that I've reached personally, the age, but I hear a lot of people talking about grief, you know, either they, someone they love dies or they break up or they change relationships or they lose a a dear, dear friend. And I wondered, since you're so connected with plants, if you had any resources. I mean, I work with flower essences, but there are other ways that we can use plants for grief. What would you recommend? Well, my second to the last book is called The Home Reference to Holistic Health and Healing. And it's all about emotional health. And so I've always found it a little sad that when somebody dies, everybody sends flowers which are all going to be dead in a week. So a week after the funeral, there's going to be like 50 bouquets of sour water with dead flowers and empty vases. So what I would give in a grief kit, um, I think it's very important to uh, help to support the lungs because very often when we're really grieved, our lungs become vulnerable. It's not unusual for people to get bronchitis or pneumonia or asthma, for example, when really grief. So support our lungs with dark orange vegetables like winter squash and sweet potatoes, carrots, pumpkin, as well as green leafy vegetables. More pungent foods like garlic and onions can be really helpful. But you mentioned flower essences. So I often, instead of sending flowers, I'll make a little grief kit with some bleeding heart flower Mm. essence, Mm. which is really good for bleeding heart. And again, Katie, as you know, it's not just death. It could be a breakup or a divorce or your pet, um, you know, running away or being lost. I also think of homeopathic ignatia, not to be confused with echinacea, I-G-N-A-T-I-A, ignatia. I also think of a, a little bottle of lavender oil, maybe some rescue remedy for when you have to keep it together and go to work, but yet you've been crying all night and maybe a little rose quartz heart. Mm. That's my grief kit. Mm. I love it. What about for panic? And are there certain, certain foods we can eat when we get that panic state? So um, panic and like panic attacks, anxiety, it has been found that when people's blood sugar is really low, they're more prone to panic attacks. So it's important to look at, you know, did you have breakfast? Did you or just have something sweet or just coffee? Because what will happen is if you just have something sweet, your blood sugar goes up. And when your blood sugar crashes, you may feel more prone to panic. But I would say that, you know, sudden fright could have a lot to do with the heart, the heart, the fire element, the heart and small intestines. So um, simply breathing more deeply and fully. And a real simple thing to do is just like open up a bottle of essential oil and take maybe you know five deep inhalations on each nostril. Lavender works great for that, but it could really be anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so rather than going down the I'm freaking out neural pathway, now you're going down Lavender Lane or Rosemary Road or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, other herbs, oat straw is very nourishing to the nervous system. There's a supplement called GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. And GABA can have come in lozenges that you can suck on. That's a little more high tech, but I also think of herbs like kava kava can have a calming effect. But there's something about the rescue remedy. But I think very often when people are panicked, they need something that's going to work um, very quickly. And so a lozenge or kava kava tincture might be used or smelling the lavender essential oil or two drops of rescue remedy under the tongue. Those are all things that I would use. And, you know, I, I feel that we're affected by 
all the media that's penetrating our consciousness. So when music is really fast and it's faster than our heartbeat, Mm -hmm. in a sense, it's taking us over. And I think that makes our hearts race. And so having conscious choices about playing music that is, you know, slow with lyrics that are positive and relaxing, the sound of running water can be very calming. So whether you have waterfalls in your home that are electric or solar, but also could be like going and sitting by a stream and, you know, look at what are the things that make you feel panicked and what can you do about that? Maybe you need to take a class in being, um, you know, more adept at defending yourself, or maybe you need to carry pepper spray, or maybe you need to have a first aid kit, or maybe you need to have a healthier breakfast. (laughs) Yeah. And you talked about sitting next to the stream and listening to the water run, being out in nature. I think that's such a, it's such a huge gift. And it's a, it's another way that we can sort of ground ourselves back into our own bodies. It's just being in nature. And I wondered if you had any experiences that you wanted to share about communicating with plants or feeling a sense of consciousness around you through plants and mother earth well i really do think the plants communicate with us a lot and there's an ancient system called the doctrine of signatures which i'm sure you've heard of that you know plants tell us what they're good for very often by the way they look and by the way they grow so we started out talking about dandelion and, you know, because it's everywhere and it's such a survivor, I feel that's this message. Like I can help you adapt to this modern age of, you know, stress and pollution and adversity, you know, very often roots are really good for helping you to feel grounded. You know, the colors of plants, I encourage my, I have three grandchildren and one of the ways they check in with me is like, Grumair, I ate something orange and red and blue and purple today. It's like, good, like, remember the greens tomorrow. So eating all the different colors of the rainbow because each color indicates a different phytonutrient, whether it be lycopene or beta carotene or chlorophyll or anthocyanins. But we could look at like right now, I made borscht yesterday because one of my housemates is on her moon cycle. So borscht, it's a beet soup, Russian peasant soup. Is it a myth? No, it really builds your blood. It's really high in iron and it can really help to restore you. And it's warming and cold and red and you can make borscht raw or you can make it cooked. But in any case, I'm always going for the most colorful foods you know, kale rather than iceberg lettuce, you know, red watermelon rather than white or yellow watermelon, the the oranges, peaches, like the more color, the more nutrients. So that's a real simple thing. But I've been talking a lot about brain health and how we can prevent Alzheimer's and mental deterioration as we get older. And so I think of foods like coconut, like kind of like a hard (laughs) shell with the matter inside, or maybe cauliflower and walnuts are are great for the brain and blueberries because they really help promote peripheral circulation. Yeah. So to to me, the doctrine of signatures, but yes, I do sit with the plants and, you know, listen to their messages. I have heard them like go, when you put them in water, but, you know, and, and to treat them kindly and to help their proliferation rather than causing a dissemination of the population, like never taking too much. And I like to sing when I collect plants. It's my way of giving back to the plants. Mm, wow. I love that. That's so beautiful. When you were talking about brain health and Alzheimer's, I was thinking of another, another fruit that sort of looks white on the inside. And in its process form, doesn't have a lot of color. But I wondered what you knew about it. And that is chocolate. When um, when I was in a retreat here this past week in Costa Rica, I think each one of us women ate at least a chocolate bar or more of the local Costa Rican chocolate. And we really felt like it was giving us something that we needed extra of in that time of really deep introspection. And I'm curious, what do you know about chocolate? Well, I love cacao. It's wonderful. And it's actually, you know, we never get to enjoy the white pulp inside the fruit. It's amazing. Really quite delicious. And, you know, the Mayans use cacao beans, the little seeds pods inside as a currency. It was so valuable. And it's actually considered a violet fruit. 
because the beans have a sort of a violet color to them. So we could say that's really good for the crown chakra, our sense of intuition and connection to divine. So chocolate is full of antioxidants and I'm actually going to send you a song called Cacao by Bethy Lovelight. So um, <laughs> it's chocolate is amazingly energizing, high in antioxidants, antifungal, very high in magnesium. And there's a little poem. It doesn't rhyme, but it's easy to remember. It says, if you have spasms, think magnesium. So if you have like muscle cramps and tension, and it has a relaxing effect on our heart. So yeah, cacao is powerful magic. And it is one of my muses of how I get all these books written. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Wow. Well, if someone were to, gosh, you have so much that you've given to the world in forms of writing. If someone were to just start with one book, you know, and, and dive into your work, which, what would be the first book that you'd want to introduce them to? Of my books? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I love the country almanac of home remedies because it is so many kitchen remedies, but I am really glad about the natural first aid handbook because, you know, if you just got in a, you know, stung by a bee or fell off your skateboard or had some kind of trauma, I think you need to know what to do. And that's so important. If you're a parent, if you have kids in your life, if you live in a community, if you take care of elderly people. And even if it's none of those things, which of us have not had some kind of first aid emergency? And had we known what to do and that there was a simple thing we could do? And it might be that what you do while you're waiting for, you know, emergency help to come or en route to the hospital. But I think we all need to be prepared. So mm -hmm. I'd say either one of those books are very important. And then just a, a quick note about your app. Can you tell us about your app? Sure. So I, I've done this little phone app and it just came out for Android, but it's been available for Apple phone and it's pictures of like 250 plants. It's called, it's called, let's see here. It's called digital herbs. I don't think we can see that. I plant. Um, but basically it has pictures of over 300 and I don't know exactly how many. It's hundreds, how hundreds. Adding to it. Yeah. But you can look up like, oh, this is alfalfa. Is it edible? Is it safe during pregnancy? What constituents does it have? What does the name mean? What family it's in? You know, sometimes people have an allergy to plants in the rose family or legumes, for example. So it's good to know, is it safe while nursing, for example? So What's so nice is that, you know, phone app just fits right in your phone and you work in a food store. Maybe there's someone who comes in and they want to know something and you need to tell them, you know, Uversi is not recommended during pregnancy. So mm -hmm. to have all that information at your fingertips is really helpful. And the information in iPlant is based on information in my book, The Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine. So you know, I embrace technology. I don't live in a teepee anymore, but I really think <laughs> we need to do our best to up our game as environmentally as possible and, you know, and then leave the technology alone for a while too. Don't have right. your cell phone in your bed. <laughs> <laughs> so if listeners are interested in figuring out what are the edibles that are in their backyards or in their local communities, would you suggest iPlant as a helpful resource for that? I plant would be really helpful. Yes, there are poisonous plants out there. And some of the poisonous plants look like some of the most wonderful plants. Poison hemlock looks like Osha and wild carrot, for example. Mm -hmm. mm, awesome. And when can we expect your memoir to come out? I can't wait to read it. I'm, wor I'm working on it. Um, I just finished a chapter last night. So I think in the next, it could be a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It'll be called Wildflower Child. So exciting. Well, for the listeners, if you're ready to dive into more of Brigitte's incredible plant wisdom and on otherwise, check out her website at brigittemars.com. Thank you so much, Brigitte, for coming on the show and just showering us with such a wealth of beauty and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Many blessings to you, Katie, and to your listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.